But the North Vietnamese took advantage of the cessation of bombing to repair railroads and bridges, gearing up for a major assault on the South. U.S. President Nixon decided to attack the enemy so vigorously that it would prefer to negotiate rather than continue the endless guerrilla warfare. The attack was to be called Linebacker II. The artificial rules of engagement were lifted. Linebacker II started with a B-52 attack on Hanoi and Haiphong. The enemy defenses were heavy, but the Strategic Air Command flew 729 sorties in 11 days, dropping 15,000 tons of bombs and losing only 15 airplanes. By the 11th day, North Vietnamese opposition had been hammered into the ground. There were no more SAMs to be fired and no sites to fire them from. The North Vietnamese returned to the negotiating table, forced there by linebacker two. Among the unsung heroes of the war were the crews of the Boeing KC-135 tankers that refueled the attack aircraft in flight. The KC-135s were in effect a force multiplier. They doubled and redoubled the value of the fighters and the B-52s. The extreme danger of aerial refueling is often overlooked. The tanker is 300,000 pounds of fuel and metal moving at 500 miles an hour. It must make a rendezvous and then the gentlest of collisions with an equally swift mass of metal and fuel. The night operations and turbulent thunderstorms of Vietnam, the radio silence and the minimum lights added to the hazard. Tankers allowed fighters to take off with heavy armament loads, topping them up with fuel once they were airborne. Then the tankers would orbit, waiting to refuel the fighters on their way back from the mission. Sometimes they would use their booms to tow damaged fighters within gliding distance of their bases. KC-135s made more than 800,000 refuelings, offloading almost 9 billion pounds of fuel. The rewards for this hard, hazardous, unrelenting work were mainly psychological. A fighter pilot might say, thanks, you can count that as a save, as he broke away. But for the tanker, he would have had to abandon his aircraft. A tanker crewman rarely had to buy his own drinks on a fighter base. In Vietnam, visual reconnaissance assumed the importance it had gained in World War I. The intimate nature of war in Vietnam, brothers fighting against brothers in their own villages, made visual reconnaissance absolutely critical. But the USAF could not select its own targets from reconnaissance photos. That was the responsibility of the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. The MACV also determined the time, location, and manner of reconnaissance missions. Despite these command difficulties, the reconnaissance crews continued to plunge unarmed into hotly defended zones to bring back essential photographs. The most intimate of all forms of reconnaissance in the war was the forward air controller. Uh, the FAC had to ensure that a target was in fact the enemy and that friendly personnel and installations were not damaged. The only way to do this was to fly low and slow in a combat area, vulnerable to everything from a thrown rock to anti-aircraft fire. For much of the war, the FAC flew unarmed light aircraft, like Cessna 01s. Okay, real fine. Okay, uh, 6-1, I'd like you to put your bomb just short of 2. Give me a little bit of He had to find the target, call for fighter bombers, mark the targets, and control the attack.
All this, and the ability to assess damage, called for extreme skill and courage. Later in the war, fast forward air controllers, jet F-100s and F-4s, conducted fast reconnaissance in high threat areas. Only the most experienced veterans, in first class physical condition, could withstand the four to five hours of low level flight and high G turns demanded by this mission. It was service at the sharp end of the stick, as valuable for saving innocent lives as for hitting the target. Strategic airlift was more important in Vietnam than it was in either World War II or Korea. Neither the harbors nor the roads of Vietnam permitted timely unloading of ships. 34 squadrons of the military airlift command were dedicated to airlift. Initially, most of the aircraft used were obsolete Douglas C-124s. The first major boost to cargo capability was the Lockheed C-141 in 1965. It could carry twice the C-124's cargo, twice as fast and twice as far. In 1969, the controversial Lockheed C-5A became operational. Ultimately, 73 of these giants saw service. Tactical airlift in Vietnam came into its own with the arrival of the Lockheed C-130 Hercules, an immensely strong four-engine turboprop. The transports operated routinely in the combat zone. Some analysts have written that tactical airlift was more important in Vietnam than the interdiction provided by tactical fighters. Transports carried men and cargo to the scene of battle. They were used in major parachute assaults. It was back-breaking, knuckle-biting work, and it went on routinely, day after day. From 1967 to 1973, Tactical airlift carried more than 7 million tons of passengers and cargo within South Vietnam, almost 10 times the total carried during the Korean War. Equipped with cannon and gun ports, the aerial gunship was a joint product of inspiration and desperation. The theory was that the pilot would make pylon turns, sighting his wingtip on a point on the ground and circling around it. Guns in the side of the aircraft could be sighted accurately on the relatively stationary target. There were plenty of C-47s around to be converted as gunships. The AC-47 gunships came to be called Spooky or Dragon Ship or Puff, inspired by the song Puff the Magic Dragon, referring to the outpouring of flame and smoke when the guns were fired. Demand for gunships increased, and faster, more modern aircraft were selected for conversion. Among them was the Lockheed AC-130. Like an ancient ship of the line, the Lockheed Martin AC-130 is truly an angel of death. It bristles with side-firing weapons, from the 20-millimeter Gatling guns, to the 7.62 miniguns, to the 40-millimeter cannon. Taken together, their volume of fire makes it a dominant battlefield weapon. The gunships were extremely cost effective in terms of the numbers of trucks destroyed and the number of lives saved in defending villages and ports. It was lonely, dangerous work, but rewards for saving forces on the ground or destroying enemy supplies were immediate and apparent. Vietnam veterans once the object of contempt in the eyes of a small but vocal part of the community, are now seen as the heroes they were, men and women who are trying to do their duty. Of all the missions in Vietnam, the one that best captures the spirit of good intent is that of the search and rescue teams. They risk their lives day in and day out for their motto, so that others may live. 
By 1968, every air crew member flying in Southeast Asia knew that if he went down, every effort would be made to rescue him, regardless of location, cost, or impact on other missions. And most people would have uh, broken all of the rules. They would have done anything possible to rescue a downed colleague. It was not until November 1964, after more than 20 aircraft had crashed or been shot down, that the first official trained search and rescue capability became available. Eventually, standard rescue teams used Douglas A1E Sky Raiders, known in Vietnam as Sandys, as armed escorts. The job of the Sandys was to put down suppressing fire to keep the enemy away from the downed air crew while the helicopters went in to make the rescue. Okay, as soon as you two get through, go out, pick up the jollies, and bring them in. In 1965, the Sikorsky HH-3E helicopter, the Jolly Green Giant, was introduced. The rescue helicopters endured everything from attacks by MiGs to running the gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire. In the last search and rescue operation of the war, Air Force and Marine helicopters flew mission after mission to ferry out South Vietnamese patriots who dare not face the communist occupiers. <laughs> 